it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Ibrahima Sonko to the From the Club podcast. Thanks for coming on. Pleasure. Pleasure's mine. Ah, thank you. Songs, tell us everything we need to know about you in 60 seconds. Yeah, obviously a former player, you know, uh, getting back into football now. Now I'm coaching at Union saint Jules in the uh, first division in uh, in Belgium. But yeah, I think uh, everything everything else people already know. If they don't know me, uh, they can make some search. But I'm sure that if they manage to contact me, I will tell them everything about me. It's no yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully we'll do a good job of unpacking a lot of your career, you know, during our time together um, today. Let's go back to the very beginning, though. What was life like as a kid? Life? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm born in Senegal, but left Senegal within my first six months. Um, went to France, to Paris, where I grew up. Um, started football around the age of four years old. Um, yeah, and uh, growing up in the suburb of Paris, playing in a small team, you know, for a bit. Um, I had an opportunity to leave my parents at 12 years old to go to um, to Lens at information, but my parents thought I was a bit too young and they wanted me to carry on with school. I had another opportunity at 14 to go and get uh, to Auxerre where I would have probably met at that time uh, Gibral CC because he was there. But once again, my parents say no. And at 16, uh, you know, uh, I had to cry for my parents to let me go. <laughs> but they ended up letting <laughs> me go to St. Etienne. And uh, yeah, I'd done St. Etienne for a year and a half. And yeah, they let me, they let me, uh, they let me out for that. I wasn't good enough to be a pro. Yeah. I mean, there you are, you start playing football around four years old. At what point did you begin to realise that you were a lot better than all of your mates and that there was real potential for you to be able to make a career out of it? Uh, to be honest, I never thought I was better than my mates. <laughs> really? <laughs> Until now, you know. Um, I think where I was lucky is, uh, you know, as a child, you know, it's, you rather got the skills or you don't have. And sometimes when you don't have it, you get bullied a little bit. You know, and people mock you around, but I was the taller than everyone. So people weren't mocking me, you know what I mean? They yeah. they had that, you know, that that fear that I was going to beat them up or something like that because I was taller, and, you know, than them. But um, um, I was very aggressive, you know, obviously. I didn't have the skill ball-wise, you know. So I had to play with what I had, which is I was quick. I was aggressive, you know, so, and I, I, I was pretty much lucky to learn to read the game very early, you know, covering and everything. So started as a number six. And obviously with the lack of, you know, lack of skills, they start pushing me backwards, you know, because I was quick, I was strong, you know, I could jump and everything. But yeah, if if I compare myself to the people I was playing at the time, with Arch still my mate now, I wasn't better than them. You know, I yeah. think that a couple of them were better. But sometimes when you got less, you work harder, you know, and that was my case, you know, from very young, I used to just have that, I need to work, I need to work, I need to get better, I need to get better, I need to get better. And I was just focusing on what I could do. I wasn't focusing on what I couldn't do. I wasn't someone who's going to dribble past two or three players, but I was making sure that you don't go past me. Yeah, that's that's yeah. that was my aim. It's like I need to be a better defender. Yes, you can dribble, I can't, but you can't pass me. That that was my aim. You know, that was a way to stop people from laughing at me. You know, when they say, "Oh, you can't do this," and I'm like, "Yeah, but you can't go past me." <laughs> that's all. <laughs> you know, and yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was that was it's a challenge. Yeah. But I think that because I I developed that mentality very early. You know, I become really aggressive. If I feel like you're going to go past me, I would foul you. But I will make sure that I hurt you at the same time. But that was when I was a kid, you know. And uh, and I grew up that mentality. So very young, around six, seven years old, they just pushed me two years older because I was yeah. already physically able. But yeah. I was also, like I say, physically um, very uh, much into impact games, you know. So when I was on... U6, U7, they pushed me to U9 straight away. And from U9, I went to U13 directly and they put me in a mix. And yeah. yeah, I had to hold my ground. And that's what developed all the physicality of my game. 
Yeah. And because you were so big, how did you avoid having to put a shift in in goal? Uh, it's one of his things. Like, um, uh, I never liked it. I never was scared of the ball. But, yeah. uh, you know, I can tackle, I can do anything. But for me, I think goalkeepers are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. You need yeah. something, something must be missing in your head for you to be able to. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, I'm not scared of, you know, of a ball coming at me, you know, hitting yeah. me hard. But to know that I'm going for it all the time, like, are you okay? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, but, exactly. you know, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's crazy. But fair play to them, you know. I mean, they are strong character, and I think I didn't pass the cap of craziness, you know, to be a goalkeeper. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I mean, obviously, in your position, you you develop great relationships with various goalkeepers throughout your career. Who was your favourite goalkeeper to play in front of? <sighs> Marcus Animan, obviously. Yeah, he was a character. Um, he was vocal, but he's someone which um, who doesn't like to to concede goals, and was pulling out the best of you all the time. Like if he take a goal, you know, whatever is is a corner or like a long shot or anything like that, it will get on your case. Why did you yeah. not block it? Like I wasn't even near it. I don't care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't care. One of you sort of, you know, and that kind of things, you know, like literally pull the best out of you, if you understand yeah. what I mean, when you got someone which is like, so, you know, so like, uh, I would say, so much into, guys, you know, we have to take proud of, uh, pride of like being, you know, a team that we don't concede goals. I don't like mm-hmm. it. You don't like it. Let's do that. And, uh, and yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that, that was Marcus for sure. Yeah. You mentioned, obviously, growing up playing football with your mates. I understand that you've actually got a, another famous footballer within your family. Tell us about him. Who? Uh, let's say, Bakary Senya. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of his things. You know, I, I did, uh, we, we didn't grow up together, so I don't I don't really know him. He was like, uh, when he moved to uh, to Arsenal, you know, I was talking to my parents after, even Leroy Sane as well as my cousin, and I didn't even know. And uh, while I was playing for Reading and we gone up to the Premier League and everything, one day I was talking to my dad over the phone and everything. He said, yeah, you're going to meet your cousin. So I'm like, my cousin. They say, yeah, you're going to play against him. I say, who's my cousin? And he went back to Sane. I went, oh, all right. He said, yeah, you older than him so you don't know his family but your younger brother knows him knows his family and everything and I went okay he said yeah so you guys gonna meet and I said okay well I will try to contact him and say hello you know that's how we we got in touch and then later down the line when um, Lira Sani went to City they told me also that we were connected you know and everything and there is another player also. I mean, I've got two or three cousins who made it, and I don't know how, but, <laughs> Mate, <laughs> but that would good. be some that would be some five a side team, right? Reunite yeah, the boys. Yeah, I know it's it's mad, but uh, yeah, you'd be dominating yeah. the soccer sixes, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it was it was good. It was good. It was good. We met a couple of times, you know. We had a chat. Yeah. We're still talking now. We are often on the nice. phone and everything, but um, yeah. I'm happy that uh, he, uh, his career went the way he went, you know. Yeah, brilliant. So you then, after you know, you, you get scouted. Um, you're then playing for Grenoble in France, aren't you? You're within the, within the uh, system there. What do you remember about hearing that Brentford were, were were looking at you? What do you remember about that time? Well, you know, Brentford actually wasn't looking at me. What happened is um, I was at Grenoble after being left go by um, by Saint Etienne. You know, I was supposed to go to Italy, um, to Genoa, because they wanted to sign me. My parents were like, we let you go at 16. Now you want to leave the country at 18. Nah, that's not on, you know. And, uh, Italy at the time, you know, now it's probably better, but at the time, didn't have the best reputation when it comes to uh, African players, you know, um, and everything. So uh, my parents were like, I'm not sure you're 18. You're still, you're still young and everything. I think the only pretty much black people who were playing in Italy it was George Weah at the time. Uh, we had George Weah, Thierry Henry, Trezé Gay, you know, in a certain way, and um, Terrible West at Inter, you know. And uh, 
So there was there wasn't many. So my problem was like eight, eighteen. Uh, I think when you make it and you become a first team player, maybe it will be easier. But right now, it's not it's not the place for you. So I give up to that idea, and I went on trial at Grenoble, which were in the third tier of football of France at the time. But I went there to go to the reserve. They were in a fifth year, I think, of football in France. And um, so I went there. Everything went well. They signed me after after a week. And uh, I played there for like two years. And we on the first year, I was with the second team. The second year, I was with the first team. I was lucky that, yeah, someone got injured and I got injured pretty much at the start of the season. Played about 31 games and we got promoted, you know, which was cool. We won the league. And... Um, and this, that year in the second division, I didn't play much. I was only like 14 games, something like that. You know, I was on the bench a lot. And at the end of the season, the the coach told me that he's going to sign some new players, some more experienced players, because he want to push up for the, prim, the Premier League, in French League One. I went, OK. So um, I remember a team like called Le Mans, they wanted to sign me in the second division, but Grenoble wasn't ready to let me go. And uh, they were saying that, you know, I could be a good asset coming up from the bench, you know, and everything. But I didn't want to do that. And at the time, we were lucky because you could actually leave your club and your country and go to another to another country and play there. But you won't be allowed to come back to your to your own country where you were playing until, um, like, let's say, a certain amount of time, mainly like the, the time of your contract, you know. Yeah. So when I left for England, I was still contracted to to Brentford. Uh, sorry, I was still contracted to um, to Grenoble. You know, I, I had no choice. I asked around all the people, all the you know, I, I talked to all the older players about the situation, and they all give me the answer like, "Listen, you got nothing to lose. You're still young. You know, you're twenty. You got nothing to lose. Just go." Go if it doesn't work out, you find a way to play in the lower division, then you make your way up. And I went, yeah. So I decided I made up my mind and I left. Um, I remember that after I left, they looked for me for a couple of weeks. Then they found out that I was in England, so they got me banned from the French Federation. And uh, yeah, I was banned for two years, the remaining time of my contract plus an additional year, so I couldn't come back to France and play football for three years if I failed to sign somewhere in England. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was like, yeah, um, now you've got no choice. <laughs> but that's crazy. <laughs> you know? So let, let me just get this right then. So you, you left France um, with no club in mind and you basically went to England to find a club, right? So how how did you kind of start getting intros to be able to get onto Brentford's radar? What did, what did you actually do? Yeah, the uh, the people who took me to England, they first got me to Portsmouth. At the time, I read I was there and they were in a, in a championship. Yeah, well, so I yeah. went to Portsmouth and I spent there for two weeks. Uh, I remember th- that was the time where they got promoted. So they already had like a fox in ba- at the back. They had the uh, Linvoy Premiers. They had uh, the zoo also. So yeah. they had a pretty much very strong team. But I didn't know about it. I just went. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, I just went because it was an opportunity to, to play in England. So I've done two weeks there. I thought it was going all right. But at the end of it, I got injured. You know, I got injured and uh, so Harry came to me and said, listen, you know, you're a good guy. We like you. We like, I think you still need to develop. But with the situation, you being injured and me having a strong team, I cannot sign you right now, but you can stay with us, you know, until you heal. And then after that, you know, talk to your agent to get you somewhere else. But at the time, my agent let me. You know, they let me down. They literally uh, cancelled the contract because they knew that I couldn't come back to France and they le- left me for dead there. Uh, I was lucky that um, Postmus did did good for me. You know, they uh, they made sure that I was back on track before they literally asked me, obviously, to leave the hotel. And uh, obviously, I had a bit of money from my previous year. So I paid for a couple of weeks you know, in a hotel. And then at that point, there was a player called Juliano uh, who was playing for Postmus, French guy. He um, he asked me, he said, listen, come out of the hotel. It's money for nothing. Come to my house. So I went to his house for about two weeks to three weeks. And I started running at that time and everything. And 
where I was lucky is um, while I was at Grenoble, there was a French goalkeeper called Bertrand. Okay, Bertrand Bossu. He um he came. He was in England, but came to Grenoble on trial. And uh, you know how life works is. He was at the hotel for about a week, and after a week in Grenoble, I told him, "Listen, come out of the hotel and come and stay with me." You know, so he came and stay with me the second week and everything. We didn't we didn't sign him at Grenoble, but he said to me, "Lisa, take my number if ever you come to England, call me and everything." But I forgot all about it because we went through a full season without yeah. me speaking to him. And it's only when Juliano said to me, well, we need to sit down and see where you can go or I can introduce you to people in England. And that's how it clicked. I went, like, hold on one minute. I might have the number of someone. Let me call him. And then I called Bertrand. And I told him I was at Postmos and I explained to him the situation. He went, you should have told me and everything. And I went, yeah, but, you know, it came out of my mind, you know, and everything. So at that point, uh, he said to me, can you make yourself down to London and I went like yeah you know uh, I found a way so Juliano drove me to London dropped me at Bertrand's house and that's how he all started Bertrand introduced me to Tom who, who ended up being my agent for my, throughout my career in England Tom at the time was just a coach but he was a former player you know so he was a coach he had good relationship and um, I played for him for Finchley, you know, in the, like seventh chair of football of England, played one game, disaster, gave a penalty away, got booked, you know, like it was just, but it was my first game yeah. living a month, you know, and from you know, like two weeks coming back from injuries and I just got into him, you know, like, let's yeah. go, you're playing again today for Finchley. And I'm like, My, okay, <laughs> you know, don't speak yeah. English, uh, don't know anyone, you know, I just yeah. come and play. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's how it first happened. And at that game, Tom invited John Griffin. He was um, a scout for Brentford. Invited him at the game and everything. John, for I was a bit rough, but he saw potential in me and said, listen, you know what? Give him another couple of weeks, another game, and I come and watch him again and we'll see. But at that time, Wally Down was the coach at Brentford. And Tom played with Wally for the old gang at uh, Wimbledon. So they know each other well. Yeah. So Tom said, all right, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump Griff and just go to Wally. So he went to Wally and said, listen, there is that kid here. You know, I think he's got potential. Just I'm asking you just to see him. So he said, you can ask Griff. He saw him already. And Griff told him, listen, he has potential. I don't know if he's ready, but he has the potential in the future to be a good player. So they agree on me coming and play a friendly game against Fulham. Once again, it, it was just like living a week of coming back for, into football. I'm getting there, can't speak English, uh, go in a dressing room for Brentford and they, um, at uh, Fulham Ground, uh, Club and Cottage, and um, against Fulham Reserve. And I'm like, I don't know anybody. I'm just like, you know, yeah. Tom said, just like, play your game. Don't know, just focus on yourself. Don't do anything. Lucky enough, I was better than the week before. <laughs> you know, I had a very, uh, uh, very good game at, the, at that point. And I even, like, Fulham asked about me, asking, like, where does he come from? How come he's without the club and everything? Can he come and try with us and everything? I was given the choice between signing for Brentford or going uh, on trial to Fulham, which was in the Premier League. It's tempting, you know, but being someone who was kicked out from a team in a second division in France, I didn't think that I was ready for the Premier League or anything like that. And what I wanted to do is straight away show people that I can do it. And yeah. the best option was Brentford. Yeah. So I went like, I'm just going to sign for Brentford. Yeah. You know, and we, we take it from there. You know, yeah. that's how it happened really for Brentford. Incredible. So how old was you at this time? I was... Uh, 21 going on 22 21 yeah incredible yeah. i mean <clears throat> my oldest son's 19 years old so as you're talking i'm kind of thinking about him you know having to go out and and, and doing this i mean you know the, the mental strength that you had to show you know you, you mentioned you, you know you've moved to another country you've not been to before 
you don't speak the language you know you've not gone with infinite amount of resources and money right you've obviously gone there with a limited budget in terms of having to find your way around this new country i mean what do you remember about mentally having to sort of go through this season what was going through your mind at the time it was difficult i mean like you know when you're a football player you have to be ready for anything you know and um so many people told me I wasn't good enough. And I built my character. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm not good enough for you, but I will show you. That that's that's since from the minute I was young. At first I was like, you know, uh, when we were in France playing on U6 and U9, people like because I was tall already, people are like, he's not from here, he's not French, he, he he cut his edge, you know, he's older than all the players, so you're getting abused, you know, and my parents never used to come to the game, so it was easy to target us, you know. Um, it was me and another player, and they used to target us all the time, like, even being six playing for the U9, people are still saying, like, oh, he cut his edge, it's not his edge and everything, and so you, you cry at first, and then at the end, you start kicking the kids <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that, that you know that's the only way you can fight back yeah. and then you become a bit stronger and stronger mentally because you like it's you against the people you know yeah. and so I developed that mentality of like you don't think I'm good enough I don't care you know I don't care I will do what I know I can do I don't care about anything else you know oh you can't do this oh, well you know what well, I'll be a better defender yeah. That's all. That's it. Yeah, you know, he's he's quick. He's good. He can dribble. Okay, cool. I can't do that, but I'm quick and I can defend. And he's not gonna yeah. go past me. That's yeah. that's all. And doing that throughout the years built up a character in me. Where like I was age twelve when I was watching the Premier League and everything. I was like, I would play in England one day. I didn't know if I would play in the Premier League or not. But I said yeah. I will play in England one day. Why? Because I thought. The game was at that time very aggressive, you know, like the players in, are like they were fast, they were powerful. It was like a box-to-box game. And I feel like if I stay in France, I might not play at the high level because they want me to be technically good. Uh, but yeah, if yeah, I go yeah. to England, I can get away I with it. You know, yeah. it can be better yeah. for me because, you know, they a lot of long balls in the box and things like that. And that was my character, characteristic as well. So... I feel like I would play there one day. I used to be mugged by my friends, you know, saying, oh, come on, man, it's England is one of the best league in the world. I said, OK, I will play there one day. I didn't yeah. know where, but I will play in England. That was what I was saying. So yeah. when at 12, my parents say, no, you're not going to Lens, which I could have developed probably more skill by going to formation. I stay in the suburb of Paris again. Okay, at 14, okay, now you're not going. And at 16, you're already like mentally like, why well, I'm late. Everything I do, I need to do it fast. Get to the club. We got, you know, straight away in the team in under 17, under 18, sorry. Play the whole season. Been called up a couple of times for the first team at training because, like I say, physically I was, you know, above a lot of people. I remember the manager didn't really like it and I'm wondering if he wasn't the reason why he pushed me away at the end of the season. And um, so, yeah, we went to the final of the cup under 18 in France. We played against Oxa with Gibra Cisse, Philippe Mexes and the lot. We lost in the penalty. Um, yeah, I remember all of that. And then at the end, I feel like, OK, I deserve to be here because I played throughout the season. We went to the final, we lost it. But since I came here, I've been playing yeah. and I've been called up in the first team for training. So technically, in my mind, I was staying at St. Etienne. But yeah, we do the annual review. They say, listen, you're a good kid. We like you. You know, uh, we like your person and everything. But we think that you're limited football-wise and we're not going to make it. I'm looking at them thinking, I don't want a minute. You got three strikers. They went up to the first team. To, to train and I'm the only one after the strikers to go. So how can you say that I'm not good enough? He said, that's my decision. You know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't concern anyone. Just my decision. So we're going to let you go. I went, right. Okay. It's, it's okay. I can't do nothing about it. So I went in, cried because obviously you're a kid. You're still a kid and you're thinking your dream has been 
just like literally on the spot killed by <laughs> by that yeah. coach so um yeah and uh, i remember staying i because in france the way we do things like formation is like in the morning at eight o'clock you go to school 10 o'clock you come training one o'clock you go back to school four o'clock you come back training and then after that you got after school you do you know and then you go to sleep and then you repeat yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get to meet all the people than just the than your teammates, you know. Uh, the system is really good, actually. So I met in class. I, met, I had a friend called Nicola that I met in class, and uh, when we had free times and everything, his parents used to come and pick me up from the the football school, take me to their house, you know, so we can play together, stay together, have a laugh and everything, and drop me back. Yeah. So I developed this relationship with Nicola Santijen. So when I uh, when I got kicked out from the the, the football uh, side of it, I, I had two choices. Go back to my parents in Paris, you know, and start all over again. But I didn't know how my parents could assist me. I know my mom would be like, no, you're good at school, you stay at school. Because I, I was still at school. And I, I prefer you to carry on school because I was kind of good at it. And... Um, and everything. And then I spoke to Nicola and I said, listen, I don't want to go back to Paris because I'm scared that if I go back, I'm going to be pushed back into school and football will be over. He went, so what do you want to do? I say, will your parents allow me to stay with you? He said, yeah, my parents won't have any problem. You know, I, uh, my room is big enough. You know, they will put another mattress and you sleep, yeah. uh, you sleep there. And I went, you sure? So we went and speak to his parents. Who say to me, but what's your parents gonna say? I say, oh, my parents don't have any problem, but I never talked to my parents about it. <laughs> they say, are you sure? Yeah. I say, yeah, they don't have any problem. They they be okay. Yeah. So they say, yeah, it's no problem, you know. But make sure you call them every day and everything to tell them that you're okay. I say, yeah, it's no problem. On the other side, my parents are like, you know, coming back for holiday. I say, now I do. I need to do some extra work because uh, I'm late into my formation, so they want me to use the summer to do more work. My parents were like, okay, no problem. So I lied to my parents and stay with Nicola, not only so I can carry on training, but also because his parents um, used to be good at using the internet and finding, you know, finding yeah. things. So I say, can you help me to find a team? So they were looking at teams for me. They got me the trials in Genoa, the trials in Grenoble, you know. And uh, so, yeah, so I lied to my parents in a good way because I wanted to stay into football. I knew yeah. that if I didn't, I will go back to school, but I wanted to stay and I needed that summer to figure out what's going to happen, you know? So um, I stayed there every morning with Nicola. We were getting up. Nine o'clock, I was out up to like 12 o'clock training with him. Yeah, it's nothing like a quote, Nicola, you know, but uh, he loves football. And uh, he used to take me stairs, you know, run, stairs run football and everything so he become kind of like a, a yeah. coach for me you know we yeah, were, yeah, we yeah. have the same age you know it's so funny yeah, but yeah. we had that relationship going um and uh so that's what i did all summer so literally i got stronger i got faster i got more muscular you know we've been doing only this for like literally for four weeks so uh, when his parent told me okay um we're going to pay your flight to Genoa. They speak to your parents before you go, you know, because you're going to go on trial there. Spoke to my parents. They say, okay. You know, I gave them all the information and everything. They say, okay, do you need anything? They send me pocket money. And Nicola's parents pay for the flight and everything, made sure that everything was okay. So I went there, played the tournament in Napoli. Did very, very well, actually. And the kid used to call me Terry West. You know, obviously, you know, at the time he was the main man, you know, over there. And uh, Genoa proposed to sign me. When I spoke to my parents, they say, yeah, we can't let you go to Italy. Yeah. You have to, yeah. you know, you have to stay at saint Etienne because for them, I was still there. But don't go to Italy, stay at saint Etienne. I went, okay. So I went back to saint Etienne. I told, I explained to Nicolas' parents, but my parents don't want me to sign in Italy. So they said, all right, but you're going to have to go down the division. I said, I just want to play football. You know, I don't care. I just want to play football and, I will have to do it my own way. So that's when I went to Grenoble and trial, you know, two weeks after that. But uh, it, it's crazy. I had to, uh, yeah, to lie, to have that character, you know, to build the character in me who, yeah, who made me who I am today. 
it, it, it's incredible, isn't it, hearing these stories? Because as football fans, you know, we see you guys, you know, the, the announcement comes on social media that the club has just signed this brand new player. And for us, you, you know, we don't know the backstory and the scars and the mental toughness that, you know, some of these players, including you with your story, you know, what you've had to go through to get to the point where you have to be able to actually achieve and to be able to get a professional contract. And then, you know, it's just an incredible um, insight into, you know, into your story, you know, that a lot of fans want to hear. In terms of the trial games, here you are, you've just played this game against Fulham. You know, you've got these two choices, these two doors in front of you now. You've chosen to to um, sign for Brentford. How long did you have to wait? So obviously you've now moved your life from France to, to England. What did that settling in process look like? And how long did you have to wait before you was brought into the first team squad and then given given your debut? I was lucky. Um, when I signed for Brentford, um, I remember there was... Um, what's his name? Uh, I forgot his name. Uh, it will come back to me. Brentford was just losing one of the best defenders. You know, Darwin Powell, Darwin Powell. He was moving yes. from Brentford to Crystal Palace. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so for Wally, he was a like to like, you know, signing, you know, really, because he got this big six foot two, six foot three, you know, a monster at the back, you know, and everything, athletic and everything. And uh, we lo- you lose him to Crystal Palace and then you got one coming on trial and it's like, the skinnier copy of him, <laughs> you know, but you know, with all the attributes to defend. So, uh, well, he was like over the moon, you know. He signed me on a, I played on a Wednesday. I remember going on the first day to sign my contract, and on the Friday morning, I was in a bus to travel. We were playing away at, uh, I think it was Huddersfield. Yeah. Yeah. On a, on a, on a Friday morning, we went to Huddersfield. And uh, another player came in, Leo Roger, you know, um, who came in, signed the same, like literally the day, the same day as me signed and was on the bus as well. So while he said, you guys going to play together, I'm looking at him, shaking his hand, but he speak English. <laughs> okay. And uh, so we were sharing room and Leo, I remember that night came to me and say, um, he's trying to, you know, using his phone, trying to speak French and saying to me, listen, we're going to have to be simple. He said, the ball in your hair, you want the ball? Sonko. Okay. If Ro- if if Leo, you get out. You know, like trying to explain to me in a certain yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I say Leo, you get out. If you say Sonko, I get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay. Okay. But I was saying okay to everything, like, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, and every time he was saying, if you want, if I say tight, tight, you go close. I'm like, okay, okay. So in the game, we're playing, and like, Leo, tight, 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 tight. He's looking at me thinking, you're telling me tight all the time, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, but it was a good relationship, you know, and uh, still going on now, actually, with him. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So the next day, me and Leo, new defense for Brentford, he's coming from, I can't remember where he was at the time when he left and he came to Brentford, but I was coming from France and we ended back like that and we ended up winning the game. We ended up winning the game with a clean sheet. And uh, I remember the striker, I can't remember his name. Uh, I forgot his name, but one thing is sure that is like throughout the game, I probably had met him about four times. Now, like when you go, because the yeah, thing is, yeah, like, yeah. like I said to you before, the England in England, the players were so good at winning the ball in the air. Like that was one of the characteristic of England. It's like the ball's coming, you know, from the keeper. They win the the ball. Someone goes behind, and I remember the first jump I went, and the guy went boom in front of me and won it, and I'm like. On the head, it uh, never happened to me. I never lost a head. Huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. I'm like, okay, okay. All right, second ball. He went up. I went up. He won it, and I headbutt him. You know, and he fell. And I went running. And the referee called the game. You know, you okay? You okay? He's looking at me, thinking. Next one, I came back. Bam! I headbutt him again, but he won the ball again. So I get, in, I'm getting frustrated, and the referee telling me. You know, you need to chill, you know, and everything. I'm, I can't speak English. And Leo is like, doesn't speak English, ref. 
And like, I was like, okay, no problem, no problem, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the referee was looking at me like, and I remember the player was, t- and he said like that, like, that man is crazy. Next ball, I went, songs. He looked up and went like that. <laughs> and I won the first ball. <laughs> and from there, every time I was going for the ball, he was coming out of the, of the way for me to head it. But it was one of the things who, uh, who literally, I felt like, okay, I need to improve that kind of timing because I'm, I'm in for a rough time here because it's not like, it's like everyone can head the ball here. You know, yeah. so uh, that's when I started with Wally down to develop a little bit my timing on heading the ball. I could jump, but my timing was poor. And fair play to Wally. Wally took a long, long, long time for me you know, to develop, you know, he developed my left foot, you know, saying like, he said, I know you can pass it, but you need that confidence and everything, which I never had because in France, even the coaches were mocking me, you know, like when I was at saint Etienne, saying like, you're passing and like, you know, someone's like throwing a frisbee and everything because they were curly, they won't, and things like that. So it doesn't develop your confidence, you know what I mean? So you kind of, forget about the passing and you get it, you kick it yeah. because, you know, because you're thinking, well, I can't pass it, you know, and throughout the years, I started getting a bit more confident, but I've got to say, but as soon as I've got doubts, I'm not taking any chances. That's, that was me. That yeah. was me. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, but yeah, I got in straight away with Brentford. I was lucky enough for that. And I played throughout the season. You know, and the second season again before I moved to Reading. Yeah, exactly that. So, I mean, you might not have had too much time to think about it, bearing in mind, you know, there was a couple of days before your first game. But here you are, you've obviously had all of this experience and the injury at Portsmouth and, you know, all the story you've just gone through already. What do you remember about your mindset in the build-up to the game, being told that you're going to be making your debut you know, you're still a young man. You can't speak the language. Was you a player that used to get nervous? Was you kind of on the coach, you know, full of nerves? Or what do you remember about your mindset at that time? No, I, I don't think I ever got really nervous about the game. You know, obviously you, me, it was like that. I won't get nervous until my first, the first ball I get on the pitch. If the first contact or the first thing I do is not right, then I will uh, I will start doubting a little bit and I will take time to get into the game. But uh, I knew that on the first one, don't mess about with it. You know, if, if it's a clearance, just clear it as far as you can out of the pitch. But that yeah. gives my confidence. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because that means like I'm here. You know, that's yeah. a statement for me to say, I'm here. First header, I want to win it. I won't need that win. You know what I mean? I need... The first ball coming out of the sky, win the ball or head it or clear it, first block, anything in the first five minutes that can get me into my game, you know, to my best game, yeah. you know, that's yeah. what I need. So it's mentally like that. But I never got really like, oh, damn, we're playing this tomorrow. It's my first game or it's my last game or whatever. I never had that. It was more like, what's going to be my first touch? What's yeah. going to be my first contact with the ball? What's going to be my first intervention? That was all I'm worried about. Anything else with football, I don't care. Like I say, there wasn't many things I could do. So, <laughs> you know, it was important that the little thing I can do, I do it well for me to know yeah. that, okay, forget about everything that people can think about your game. You know that what you can do, you're going to do it good today. Yeah, and yeah, that was yeah. my focus all the time. Yeah, you, know, you, you mentioned there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, you mentioned about the importance of getting that first action, you know, done well to build your confidence. What about the other externals? Like, you know, was your game ever influenced by the, your position fans? You know, could you hear the fans if they started getting on your back? Did that affect your game or even opposition players? If you played against a certain striker that might be talking in your ear for the whole game, did that used to influence your game? Can you remember any circumstances where that was particularly, you know, difficult? Yeah, uh, look, um, we uh, when I signed for Reading, when I signed for Reading, um, obviously I wasn't playing at first, you know, until we went to, um, I, I came on against Milo. And uh, I came on against Milo towards the last five minutes of the game. 
you know, in the middle of the pitch. And uh, I remember Milo, you know, Milo is, is aggressive, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. we, they got a bad reputation, but you can't, you can't fold them from wanting to support the team. Sometimes they do it the wrong way, but you know what I mean? You, when you play for them, you must love it. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But when you play against yeah. them, you must hate them. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the fact, yeah. you know what I mean? So yeah. I was at Milu and like, I was, you know, about to come in and even the kids like, were like shouting abuse at you and everything. And I'm looking at thinking like, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know, obviously I was already in England for the last two years and I know the fans are really involved, but I never played against Milu and it was the first time. Yeah. I remember I came on and I was going to go and take a throwing and I went to get the ball and all the fans was like abusing me and everything, kids shouting and everything. And I just smiled. You know, it's was just like, I picked up the ball, looked at them and just smiled and they start laughing, you know, thinking like, why is he smiling, you know? <laughs> so I went in and done that. And then the first time I really come on in the, the game was at Ipswich when A.D. Williams got injured. And it was like literally third, like, like I would say 20, 25 minutes into the game. Yeah. The uh, Wally say, listen, Wally was the assistant of the couple. They said, God, warm up. I did, you know, it's not good. So I warm up for two minutes. They said, you have to come in fast because I did and everything. So I'm like, okay, I'm coming in. The stadium is packed. Okay, the stadium is packed. Ipswich used to play with. Um, Darren Bent at, at, up front. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, as well, right? Chef yeah. Yeah, 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 that yeah, was yeah. they were they were strong and everything. I was and I remember Kuchi was like literally trying, you know, going into contact with anything with his head. He was so good and Darren was so fast. So I'm coming in, I'm thinking like, right, I'm not properly warmed up. Them two strikers are good, you know. Like literally, this is a level up from the League One because they were they were good, you know. I'm like, okay, that's gonna be interesting. Yeah. Okay, so coming in all the stage and booing and everything, and I'm like, okay, uh, tough game, bad game. And first header, I went in with Kuchi, but I went and won the header, but it literally took me out, you know, like you know, literally come side on the side hit me and I went buff, you know, and he looked at me, smiled, winked, and left. I'm looking at him thinking, all right, so it's going to be like that. I'm like, okay, no problem. It's not a problem. That's how you want to play it. We're going to play it that way, you know? Yeah. And I knew that he's going to be, he was a strong man, so I knew it was going to be a tough game against him and everything. So we started and from there, I wasn't taking any chances. Any balls coming, boom. I kick it out. And I kicked actually a couple of balls off the pitch, like off the ground. And the Ipswich fan was every time I had the ball, like, oh, hey! you know. <laughs> and and every time it was making me laugh. And like at the end, I ended up smiling and like, what is looking at me? <laughs> what is smiling? <laughs> so we went in Alpha and while he came yeah. here, I went, come, come here. I said, like, whatever you do, you're doing it well. Keep going. Yeah. We don't yeah. care as long as we don't concede. We don't care kick them all out but the Reading fans didn't really know me and they were like what the hell are we signing <laughs> you know what I mean so yeah so every time I had the ball even the Reading fan was like yeah. all out <laughs> bang bang I'm like okay but every header and everything I was winning and I was yeah. quick also so Darren Ben was going behind and I think I, I did scare him a little bit because he, he, he saw how me and which she were going into each other. And he wasn't so much someone to play with contact. A contact game, he was someone which sharp in front of a goal and very quick. So every time you call, I was coming at him, he was like a bit wary about what's going to happen. But yeah, 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 for yeah. me, it was him and Kuchi and I needed to do my job. And uh, the first tackle was strong and everything. And uh, so we finished the game and I went to uh, shake his hand, Kuchi, and he went like, he said, so I'm, I'm glad to have met someone who's strong like me. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I think you are stronger, but, you know, <laughs> it was a good game. And it was, yeah. it was actually a good game. We drew that game. And that's the first time the Reading fans really saw me play. Before that, they didn't really know what I was about. We went home, we played. And like I say, I'm, I'm not someone who's going to take a chance. You know, I needed to make sure that I build 
first my reputation into the game before I can start pretending I can do some some playing, you know, and everything. And uh, it was it was it was hard the first few weeks with the Reading fans. You know, I mean, they were a bit like, okay, he can defend, but then every time he kicked the ball, he kicks it too long. He kicked it in the corners. He never wants to play short and everything. So I think they were frustrated. So. When A.D. Williams came back from injury about two months after, um, Steve Coppel had a chat with me saying, A.D. is coming back. I'm like, OK, he's captain and everything. He's been at the club before. He came back to the club. He played, you know, and he said, but I want to keep you in. I'm like, oh, OK. He said, I know it's hard with the fun, but you're going to win over them. You know, you're a defender and that's all I need. I need someone who can defend. I don't need especially someone who can play. I need someone who can defend. Eva will do, and the people around you will do the job on playing. But I know that once you get confident, you know, your, ability, your full ability will come out. And I'm like, okay, that's nice. Thank you. So he went and have a word with AD. And AD said, listen, to be fair, I've been watching the game. So the kids deserve to stay on the pitch, you know, and I'm just going to probably retire because, you know, I'm 35 now and I don't need to carry on playing. So that's how it happened, you know. So AD literally passed on, you know, the, yeah, passed on the, he sit to me. And I said, like, make sure you make good use of it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? So, um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it was it was tough at, at, at first. Even with the Reading fans, it's not like, I, I mean, they supported me because I was playing for them. But yeah. I don't think they were really confident that I was I would develop to the player I was after that. You know, at first yeah, they were yeah. a bit septic. They they definitely changed their mind over time. So I'm yeah, they did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's like this. Yeah. You you um you know we've been talking about sort of you know some of the players that you played against and um I think it's it's quite common in cricket, isn't it, where people talk about sledging, where players will get in other players' ears and they'll try and you know upset their game. As a defender, did did you did you used to talk to the strikers that you were playing against? Did you try and get into their head mentally by saying stuff to them, or did was there any strikers that you can remember playing against who used to just talk to you during a game and you know try and get into yeah. your head and distract you? Can you remember any of that? No, to be fair, and I, I was never that kind of character. You know, um, I think um, and it's it's a strange thing. And like strikers I played against, they always told me that you are so hard. You know, on the pitch, so rough, you know, and everything, but you never say anything. <laughs> I literally, I'm going to kick you and come lift you up and say sorry and kick you again in the next minute. But yeah. I will never literally I be in a confrontation with you, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I got kicked, you kick me, it's football. We have to get on yeah. with it, you know? Yeah. But this was developed because when I was a kid, I was playing in a suburb of Paris, which is... Yeah. Which is an area where like fight can start within anything. So you have to get on with it. You know, if you yeah. start like wanting to fight, to part, to speak, it's just, you know, end up in a fight. You know, I mean, you go yeah. in areas, you know, we come from an area, we already, we go into another area. They know we are from that area. It's already tension because there is fight between the areas in Paris. And then you end up talking and wanting to answer on the pitch and then it becomes a fight and things like that. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. I always kept my mind out. For me, it was like, we're on the football pitch. We leave it to that. What, yeah. ha what happened here, happened here. After that, we are friends. Uh, we don't talk. It doesn't matter. But yeah. I won't take it any further. You don't have to take it any further. We play. You can kick me. I will kick you. It's not because I want to kick you. It's because it's part of the game. I miss something and I hit you. It happens yeah. and it would be the same. So I never used to, yeah. to chat to players or anything like that. Yeah, you get often some strikers who... Sometimes want to get in your ears and everything, but I have an answer. I just literally looked at them and smiled. And I'm like, literally, my, my, my answers were like, if you were someone who was mouthy, I make sure that the first contact, you remember that you should keep your mouth shut. <laughs> that, that was to be that. fair, as, as you're answering songs, I'm thinking that was actually a, a really stupid question because if I was a striker playing against you, I wouldn't want to be there close enough to you to for you to be able to speak to me because I know you're going to kick me, right? So I'm going to be on the wing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it happens a lot that strikers, you know, deserve the position to avoid uh, being being confronted. But uh, it was like, yeah. it's with the time. You build up a reputation and 
And that was the beauty of football. It's like once you get that reputation, people are like, okay, you know, it's better to play off him instead to play near him, you know, which is which, yeah. which, is, which is good, you know? Yeah. You ended up playing more than 80 games for Brentford. As you look back at that part of your career, what, what are some of the uh, highlights for you? What are your favourite memories from that time? Uh, well, my first game, obviously, is still in my memory. You know, um, I was a bit... I'm not it's not like I was scared, but I was a bit wary, you know what I mean? Because um I stayed a long time without football and I didn't know what's gonna happen. So I was thinking like, am I gonna stop playing now because I don't have a team? Or I'm gonna play in a lower yeah. level because I don't have a team. So when I got given that lifeline at Brentford, it was something that I needed to cherish and make the most of it. You know, because I knew that I couldn't go back to France. Okay. Uh, once again, it was a risk I decided to take. It turns out well, but it could have gone the other way, you know. And uh, I'm lucky for that. I'm grateful for that. So when I first signed for Brentford, it, we played on a Wednesday. They make the. I came in on the first day for training. I met Darren Powell. who was at the day leaving, saying goodbye to everyone leaving on the other side. Me training for with them. The next day, we on the bus going, and all the way, obviously, I've got my earphones. I can't speak English, so it's not like I'm going to yeah, speak yeah. to the boys, you know. Yeah. Uh, they were playing at the PlayStation at the back, and uh, I was listening to my music, and in my head, I was like, don't let this slide. You know, this is an opportunity. Don't let this slide. You know, you have to make sure that from here on, you don't stay without the club for too long. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have to make sure that you're better than you what you used to be. You're better, you're stronger, you're quicker. And my mindset keep developing and developing and developing. And yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's probably what I remember the most. And after that, it was when they sacked Wally, I was really, really like sad in a certain way because he's the one who gave me my chance. Yeah. And uh, I felt like we let him down, you know, especially me because things wasn't going the, the way I wanted it to go in a second second season and uh, could have been better yes was I doing more to be better no at the time I think I got comfortable a little bit in the second year you know you come from nowhere suddenly you earn a bit more money than you used to earn you got a car you're discovering London you start speaking the language there was a lot going on in my head and I was still 21 <laughs> you know yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah started me who never went out in a nightclub in France before that prior to coming to uh, to England suddenly I ended nightclubs and like living the life and so yeah football started become um, a second yes a second choice a little bit you know what I mean not yeah. I came training I was training and everything but we play the game and, you know, you lose, it's okay, you go out in the night, you forget about it. Instead of like, I used like two days to forget the game that I lost. Now it's like, you take 20, 20 minutes. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah, by the time yeah. we go on the coach, you know, okay, it's it's yeah. where are we going tonight? I'm on the message, you know, why should I meet you and everything, which was the wrong attitude. But like I say, I'm discovering England, the nightlife, you know, speaking the language and everything. So, I'm being a young player, basically. And uh, when Wally got sacked, it was the wake-up call. Because just before he got sacked, Wally came to me. Say, uh, he said, I won't say I'm disappointed because I know that you give your best all the time, but I must say that you were, you weren't as good as the first season. You know, and uh, and I'm telling you, you need to... I don't know what's going on in your life, but you need to get it together because that can be a problem for you in the future. And uh, I went, I say, do you know that in the first season, within your first six months, you know, we had inquiries for you from Aston Villa, Arsenal, everyone was asking about you. And now we faded away. He said, because your performances are not that good. And I went, really? He went, like, we never told you anything. He said, what do you think Brentford increased your contract? You know, it's because they knew that they had the potentially someone to buy you. And right. He said, I know you knew in England and you don't understand everything yet, but in England you can jump from here to the top within yeah. a day. 
you know, and if you don't get things together quickly enough, you know, you might you might pass you might pass that chance and that's not good for you. Yeah. I went all right. Okay, and that's when like I started realizing that something wasn't right, you know, and uh, yeah, I went back, spoke to my agent Tom at the time, who said, Yeah, I was gonna talk to you at the end of the season about it, but now what he got sacked, you really need to lighten up because the new coach coming in was uh Alan um, what's his name again? Mike Dog, what's his name again? Uh Martin Allen. Got him Mike Dog, yeah. Martin Allen. Martin Allen, yeah, Martin Allen. Yeah. And um and he's totally different to Wally. His yeah. approach will be totally different to Wally, so be ready for a shock. And I'm like, okay, what can he do? <laughs> you know, like you know. But uh, yeah, that's when I really decided that, that, not decided. That's when I knew that something was wrong, and I started getting things back together a little bit. And uh, we ended up getting on the last day of the season, you know, um, saved by uh, the last goal for Alex Rhodes. You know, and we ended up staying in the league, in League One. But my contract was up, and uh, Brentford wanted to, to talk to me at the end of the season and everything. But um, yeah, it's a uh, it's a turning point, really, when Wally got sacked. You know. Yeah. You you obviously you know are now on the other side of a fence where you're now, you know, looking at coaching opportunities, and you're obviously with your manager's hat on almost. If you was presented with the same situation where you've got this young kid full of potential, you know, basically you, you know, but you're now managing that player. Do you think your experience as a player would be able to help you kind of almost help that player prevent from making the same mistakes that you did back then? Massively, massively. Um, I'm coaching now, like I say, uh, Pignon, saint gilloise And uh, everything I lived or everything I've been told by my coaches, you know, they're coming out now, you know, into into the ears of the players because at the time maybe as a player you don't think that it's really something catching and then when you go through it for a long time and then you start realizing that was some really really good advice you know and the players i've got um i'm coaching right now they're all like 17 18 they're playing u21 but they're all pretty much very young young you know potential pros and couple of them are already pros and I keep getting into the air saying like professionalism is not only on the football pitch at the training ground or on the game day is literally is a full-time job and if you guys don't know that you guys gonna probably experiment it the wrong way so yeah. I'm constantly talking to them you know like literally guys you know I know like we live in the training pitch you're going home but remain professional in your life is important, you know, sleep early, do the right thing, go to the gym, do extra work when we don't have training, you know, and especially some of them are still in school and make sure that you as, you know, as like clever as you can because nowadays you need your brain in football. Yeah. You know, it's not only about having the skill, it's about seeing things faster, understanding things faster. And the only way you can work your brain is at school. So. Yeah. I'm constantly repeating them words, you know, and everything I've yeah. been told, really, you know, yeah. and um, yeah. Yeah, so good. So good. You, um, we've mentioned, obviously, your move to Reading and, and, and obviously your, your introduction within to the team. You, you, you obviously developed into becoming a club legend there. I mean, the fans still absolutely love you to this day. Now, I'm surprised there's not a statue of you somewhere at the stadium. <laughs> what do you remember about that, um, you know, famous promotion winning season, Sunks? It was a fantastic season, as you can, uh, as you can, uh, yeah, as you can uh, remember. You know, it was uh, it was one of these things uh, where we gone from the disappointment of the season, the previous season, where like we lost the last game to Wigan, and Wigan was uh, getting promoted, and uh, we missed out on the playoff because they beat us three one. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was it was tough because we wanted the playoff. Even though the season wasn't the best, but we managed to clinch into eighth, and we needed that last win to get in the playoff, and we didn't. So it was it was tough for us. But um, I remember Steve Coppel, We went in just after the game, and he went all right in, uh, you know, get something, you know, on you. We're gonna go back, and we're gonna we're gonna congratulate Wigan. 
you know, for the promotion and everything because they will obviously do the celebration and everything. So I remember we getting dressed, thinking like, why do you want to do that? It's already hard to not be in a playoff and now you want us to go there. And we went outside and we saw the crowd, you know, the happiness of people, the vegan players jumping around, dancing and everything. And like, you literally like that, looking at them and everything, you know, and and you went like, I wish it was us. You understand what I mean? Like that feeling. And after 10 minutes, Copper went, all right, that's enough. Everyone in. So went back in. We sat down. He went like, that could be you. But you need to get into that position. So season is over. Make sure you come back fit next year because we got a good season ahead. At the time, you're thinking like, why did you do that? But when you come back into the new season, you got in your mind the last thing you saw, which wasn't the defeat and the fact that you lost you know, a chance to get in a playoff. You remember the fact that Wigan just got promoted and how happy they were. So we coming in thinking like, I mean, I came in thinking, buzzing, thinking like, I want us to be Wigan. Yeah, yeah. I want us to be Wigan. You know what I mean? I talked to Eva. Remember Wigan? Yeah, I said, ah, we need to be Wigan. You know, and I think that everyone must have come back for, with the same mindset. But then, first game, play move at home, we lost. <laughs> and you're thinking, oh, it's going to be tough to be Wigan now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we got beat and we went back in. And um, I thought we were going to get smashed by the coach, you know what I mean? And everything. And he went like, okay, it's the first one. It's the game on Tuesday. Let's forget about it and just move on. And we're looking at each other like everyone, you can see everyone was hungry, like very upset about that defeat. And and just, I remember now, now it comes, you know, like, like I'm looking at everyone and you can see that everyone was already in his head getting ready for that promotion because you can see it on people's eyes. You know, like when you leave it, you don't really see it. But you, I knew how I was after that defeat and I was like, no more. We don't. We, no, 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 no. I don't want this anymore. We need to get yeah. promoted. And now thinking about it, and you know, every time I thought about it, I'm looking at everyone in a room, and I'm looking at people, and everyone was like literally focused. Yeah. You know, we we didn't say anything. We just got dressed, and everyone left. But you can tell that everyone was focused, and we came back on at running on 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 the next day, and you can see everyone was already at it. It didn't seem like we played the game yesterday because. We wanted to train more. We wanted to do more training. Coach was like, all right, recovery day. we like, no, we want to train. You know, like we want to train because we thought we need to get things yeah. back on track because we can't, we can't afford to rest now. We just lost. And then we went, we won the first one, won the second one, drew the third one, won the next one, won the next one, drew the next one, won the next one. And suddenly we start believing that Arsenal did it a couple of years ago. Right, they were invincible. Why we already lost, so we won't be invincible. But can we go as close as we can? You know what I mean. And we started talking between us at the back, saying like clean shit every game, clean shit. Like I say, Marcus was like, guys, I want my bonus, clean shit today. We don't give anything, you know. And Wally was implementing that because at training session after the training, he used to put the four players in the goal and asking people to shoot, and we couldn't let the ball go through. So you have to use any part of your body, you know, and not use your hands to stop the ball from coming. We let few in, you know, obviously, because they will come and kind of like hard shots. But um, but you develop that mentality where, like, you, you don't scare the ball. You're just going to block the ball with any part of your body, but you're not going to let it in. And the training session we used to do, the defense was Jürgen working on the side, strikers on the side. But as defenders, we used to come like, used to love like, okay, you know what, today is defending only. We yeah. don't care about any part of the game. We just want to defend because we want to get better at defending. We want to get better at defending. And we used to love to not concede goals. So that mentality was in us. And and it was fantastic. We went in every game thinking we're not going to concede. And even if we concede one, there won't be a second one. You know, that was our mentality. You know, and we used to crush people because we never give up, really. And then from there, the strikers, sorry, excuse me, yeah, the strikers used to just bang on goals. They score and score and score. And like, literally, 
I think in that season, the 11 starting players have scored the goal apart from the goalkeeper. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even even the the people on the bench used to come in. They scored the they scored the goals. You know, yeah. only Marcus Animan didn't didn't score his goal at that season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Incredible. But yeah, it was it was fantastic. That season yeah. was just uh, amazing. You you mentioned defenders and strikers. Put some meat on the bones. Who who were the names of those players? Who were you playing with within that team? Uh, yeah, I had uh, Graham Murphy on the right, captain, the skip. Um, then we had um, Yvonne de Monson. and on the other side we had uh, Nicky Shore you know, as a left back, uh, Marcus Oniman, you know, but in front of us we had uh, Steven Sidwell and James Harper. Yeah. And that was mainly the starting lineup. But coming from the bench, you had BK, you know, Andre BK was there, you had like um oh, I can't remember the names. But we had a team where like Everyone's coming in, doing his job. You know, I think, I think, yeah, I think nobody in the back four missed the game through injury that season. Yeah, we all played the forty-six game. You know, uh, yeah, people were coming in towards the end of the game when we were one, one nil up or nil nil yeah. to to make sure that we considered it at the back we're not getting any goals and everything like that. But um, me and Eva literally played every game between cup games and league games next to each other without any yeah. injuries. Even when you were getting injured, get this trap and go back on the pitch. That was yeah, uh, that was there. It was a an amazing season. And then in terms of strikers, was this was this Noel Hunt? Was he part of it then? Uh, Leroy yeah. Lita? Uh, no, we had uh, Stephen Hunt who was uh, as as a winger. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah, you had David Kitson, you had Kevin Dunn, and you had Leo Raylita, Mendy Leo as the, yeah, the strikers. You know, you had Bobby Comby on the other side. You had Johnny Oster, who was on the bench, coming in and causing fire as well. You know, like I say, and in the middle, obviously, the main players were Harper and Sidwell. Once again, them yeah. two never left yeah. the pitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, incredible. Who, who were the characters within that team? Um, I think you know we all got similarities in us because we were really serious about what we wanted to achieve and how we wanted to do things, you know. And uh, Marcus was one of the characters, but he was a little bit like the dad of the team. Marcus, you know, he knew when to laugh, but at the same time, where to get everything really serious. I would skip, uh, what's his name, uh, Grand Mert, he was always serious, you know, so uh, there was no difference. Kitson was, yeah, Kitson was someone you can chat to, but he wasn't someone who was loud. He was someone you go and you can have an intellectual chat with him. Eva was also someone very quiet, Nikki Shore. You know, obviously you had Sidwan and the law where like we play cards and have a laugh and everything. But I don't think that we had anyone really crazy in the team you know we yeah. were doing jokes and everything having love like any any players will have with his teammate because he had a good bond but they weren't really characters who come out to be too extravagant I would say you know yeah. in, in any different way you know so what, what was, you lived with Leeway for a bit didn't you I've heard him on a yeah. podcast he seems like a real character what was he like Leroy, Leroy is quality. Leroy is quality. He's, he's, one of, he's always up for a laugh, you know, and everything. <laughs> uh, very serious in his football. He's, I think he's still playing now. Uh, yeah. He's very serious in his football and everything, but he's someone you can have a laugh with, especially when you're outside football and you're, you're hanging with him, you know what I mean? It's some, some, you, probably, you spend some good time with him, you know? Yeah. And again, yeah. Leroy is someone who's really, really reserved. You know, and um, when you reach him, you know, you really discover who he is. But yeah. before that, you might think that Leroy doesn't really want to talk to you or anything like that. But he's the way he is, you know what I mean? He's not someone who is openly going to come and talk to you. But when you come to him, you know, he's one of the nicest guys in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We mentioned earlier on about, you know, Back in France, you was watching the Premier League, so you knew what you was being parachuted into when you come to England. And then there you are playing against some of the best strikers in the world. Who were the hardest strikers for you to defend against? What, what were some of your most enjoyable games? There was many enjoyable games. You know, uh, 
the Chelsea one in 2000, um, 2006 was one of the most memorable one, obviously, for the right and the wrong reason. Because we end up losing that game, but we end up playing literally one of our best games in the league. We lost one name, uh, unfortunately, because I got injured. And then um, I got in um, on contact with uh, Kudicini in the same game. He got, he got injured as well. And John Terry went in goals. But uh, when you come, when you talk about, you know, the way I used to see the Premier League, you know, that game was exactly what the Premier League used to be when I was a kid. You know, like you had John Terry, Drogba, Frank Lampard on the other side, not only qualities, but also the strong, strong people, you know, and with like characters. And you had us, we just got promoted and wanted to establish ourselves in the Premier League. So we needed to fight back. And the game was like a proper game, end to end games, you know, aggressive people getting into each other, not in a nasty way, you know what I mean? But in football way, just like, football used to be, you know, and you, Mourinho being the coach, he wasn't like going to be like Guardiola passing the ball around, you know, I mean, you always know that they're going to play to the strength, give it to Drogba, play off Lampard, you know what I mean, and they're scoring, they go, that's the, what they used to be at the back with uh, with Thierry, Ivanovic and everyone, they used to be very strong and you know that they're going to go through you to get the ball, but they, you know what I mean, so it was a game where like, even couple said it, today you have to man up you have to play like men because if you play like kids, they're going to destroy you. You're going to play like men. You have to stand up to them physically because if not, they're going to hit you alive. And that's what we did. Unfortunately, we got the two goalkeepers who got injured in the game, which is a bit shadow a little bit the game, you know what I mean? Which, you know, you regret that that happened. But at the same time, that makes it a game, like a memorable game. Nobody can forget, really. You know? But yeah, but talking about that, yeah, one of the for different reason because obviously the like of Rune, Cristiano Ronaldo was still there and they were extremely good. Uh, you had Drogba on the other side, Fernando Torres on the other side. So literally, you're playing against like some top, top, top notch quality um, strikers. But the one who uh, I never knew how to mark him or what to do with him was Berbatov. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, okay, uh, you wanna you can't outstrength him because he's still he's tall, he's big guy. His first touch is just wow, okay. He can play back to goals coming as much as he can play. You know, facing you, technically, you know, he's good. Like initially, it was the first time I was like, okay, how should I approach him? Because yeah. throughout the game, I didn't know how to, what to do with him. You know, like when you think that you got him, his first touch is so amazing that he's going to set someone, you know, in his first touch. I mean, Kanu was good. Kanu was like really good. Same fit and everything, really, really good. But Berbatov was stronger. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so well, yeah, it what, was, it was it difficult. Was because people have, I've heard people say before that he was a lazy player. Was, was he? Did that come across? Was he? Was he? What was his work rate like on the pitch? No, I think. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's the same word in English, but we uh, we say he's nonchalant in French. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know if it's the same word, but it was one of his. You think he's not quick, but he actually <laughs> is quick. <Yeah. laughs> you know, you. F- I think like Except because of his body, you know, he's yeah. he's really tall. He's really tall, so you think like. Uh, it's not moving, but everything it does is so perfectly done. Yeah. I mean, there is a reason why Man United signed him, and he did well oh, yeah. at Man United. You know, I mean, you yeah. don't, you know, you don't go to Man United. You feel not one of the best players, sure. and if yeah. you're lazy, you're not playing for United. Yeah, for sure, that's a yeah, fact. Yeah, you know, what I mean, trade. so, uh, yeah. so yeah, he's he's uh, one of the most complete players I ever met on the football pitch. Like I'm talking yeah. about complete. You know, every like I say, every player. Got attribute, okay. But him, he had he had it all for me. I don't know what other people think, but for me, he had it all, and it was he made it more difficult to mark him. I think any football fans uh, watching this interview, songs would be so happy to hear 
that you're, you know, you're back in football and you're doing your coaching badges. And what, what's been your experience of, of obviously going through that process in terms of gaining the qualifications and looking for opportunities? Is that been an easy thing for you? Has it been a hard experience for you? Sort of talk us through that. Yeah, um, going through the badges was the most easiest thing in the world. I mean, the, the FA, fantastic. You know, I mean, they, they do anything for you to have what you need, you know, and you carry on your journey in football. And uh, I could never thank them enough. You know, they facilitate everything for you um, to make sure that you got it. And uh, the education also is really good. You know, they really, they get really close to you. You know, you end up thinking that you know them forever, the people who are working there, you know, and they still stay in contact with you. They still contact you to see if you, what you're doing and how you're developing and everything. They want to hear from you. And that's amazing. Now, when you come to finding a job, it's been difficult. Yeah. It's been difficult. I know that I'm not in England where I would say that people know me the most and maybe would have made it a little bit easier maybe to find a job in an academy or something like that, going back to all the academies where I played, the teams I played for. But um, it's been difficult. The lack of opportunity is, it wasn't apparent at first, you know, when you hear it, you're thinking, oh, come on, guys, you know, I mean, you're just not looking enough. But now I am in the middle of it, in the middle of it, and I realize that there is a lack of opportunity, you know. Um, people talk about racism, and I'm thinking, I don't think it's racism, I think it's trust. You know, uh, unfortunately, not yet, we don't have, you know, we start having, you know, the like of Patrick Vieira, who did okay, you know, and the like of Vincent Company is doing quite well. But we don't really have um, black coaches who went and make it big, you know, obviously Chris Hilton was there, Darren Powell was there for a bit, you know, um, Pauli, um, you know, yeah, they did what they had to do, you know, to an extent, but none of them was as successful as the like of Mourinho and you know, and bigger, 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 bigger names, you know, but um, I don't know if it's because not enough of us didn't have the opportunity. So, you know, the percentage of succeeding will be smaller. Or I don't know if people just think, you know, well, we are not racist, but can we just trust them into coaching and managing a team? Because we don't see many of them being selected for that position. So I would say we need people to trust that, you know, if we were good enough to be players, we are good enough to be coaches. Yeah. You know, and it's trust. It's not racism. You know, I mean, I refuse to think it's racist because too many now black players and ethnic minority play football. So, and they've been all appointed by the same chairman who are not appointing black coaches. So I think is we need to come in, show what we can do. We need people to trust and give us time to show them what we can do, you know, before they make decisions. But right now the decision I made, you know, from the minute they see who you are. And that's not good. Yeah. You know, and if yeah, it's a sad part of it. Yeah. If there are any football club, I know I know you're coaching and you've got a role right now and um, you know, it might not be in the immediate future, but if there are any uh, sort of club owners or chairmen listening to this right now, if they were to offer you an opportunity, what kind of coach or manager would they be hiring if they were to give you an opportunity, Sunks? It's, uh, yeah, I'm laughing because uh, even the, um, because I, obviously I took the assistant job in the 21s and uh, even the first, the first coach is like, uh, I'm really engaging, you know, I engage a lot with the players. You know, yeah. so I can't stay still on the bench and watch things happening. It's almost like I'm still playing a little bit because when I was a player, I used to organize and talk a lot, you know, a little bit directing people. In the development system, some people say it's not really good because you're not helping the kids, you know, helping him to think, you know. And uh, on my side, the way I, I got developed in France, we will say that, even though you need to let him think, you still need to guide him. Yeah, yeah. You know, you still need to guide him. 
in England, they will say, yeah, but it's better to let them think for themselves sometimes and ask them the question and everything. But when you are in a game situation, you don't have time to ask him what's gone wrong. You can do it at training, which I do. But in game, I need to rectify because I know that if we concede the goal or we lose the game, that's going to affect them deeply. And then they won't be able to think. They're just going to think that they lost the game. The next game is going to be tougher. You know, so I prefer to rectify them to avoid a catastrophe and then talk about it later why I rectify them, you know, which I do a lot. You know, I kind of write down what I see and when I rectify you and I come back to it with you after the game just to tell you this time. Remember here, this and that happen. Next time, think about it. So, you know, so they got it in their head, you know, and it's, do it's working well because all the players are always calling me after the game when they're home for feedback, telling me how was I today and everything. So something must be working. And that's what I want, you know, that's for me satisfaction to know that the players are calling me individually to ask me what I feel and hear what could have done better and things like that. So that's that's perfect. But if there was someone to hire me in the future, they just need to know that I like to be close to my boys. You know, uh, I like to take the hit from them, you know, and take responsibilities for what's going to happen. After all, I'm the coach, I'm the one who's going to decide how and how and which formation we're going to play, you know, and I will make sure that the players get behind me because I need them as much as they need me, you know, and that's the kind of coach I am. You know, I, I saw many coaches with whom I work and they were like that, you know, back in us in every kind of situation and I love that. I love that they back us and they're not literally trying to change us or anything like that. They see the team, they see our potential and they we're playing within our potential. We're not trying to reinvent football because you see it a lot nowadays. There is a culture in football where like Mr. Guardiola came in, changed the world of football, which is great. But it's not every team who can play that way. But every team tries to play that way. And I think sometimes it's wrong. You have to play within the strength of your team. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? You want to build from the back. Yeah, but you don't have the players. You, you, you don't have multi-million players, you know, pound players at the back being able to do that. You don't have John Stone who can run with the ball and, you know, and yeah. triple people. So why do you want to create, why do you want to take Zuma and ask him to do what Stone is doing? No play Zuma to his strength. He's a great defender. You know, he's a lesser talented when he got the ball, yeah. But he's still a very good player, important player, you know. And that mix until you can get better players or players who can play the way you want. That's that's what you have to look at as a coach. You have to look at your strength and play within your strength. But what we did at Reading and it worked, so I'm not going to change anything. Yeah. Well, Songs, we're definitely cheering you on for your, you know, your opportunity um, to, to be a manager. And um, I know that any club that will end up, you know, giving you an opportunity will be very blessed by you being a part of the, uh, the club very as nice. well. Thank so you very much. Thank you. We're going to take a very quick break and we're going to come back and ask you um, the signature from the club questions. <laughs> Traveling to a restrictive country with internet censorship? If you want to access your country's websites and content you love securely, a VPN is the answer. With just a few clicks, NordVPN changes your virtual location. You can enjoy your favorite websites and services securely, as if you're home. Choose from over 5,000 servers in 60 countries and surf the internet with no restrictions. So Ibrahim, as you know, as a business, we're all about official signed memorabilia. So these last few questions are all memorabilia related. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's go. So Songs, have you ever asked anybody for their autograph before? No. No? Really? No. All of these amazing players that you played with, never. <laughs> I know. You know, you know, it's it's funny. Yeah, it's funny because you know, like, I've got no shirts or anything. Really? Like, literally, 
I gave everything away, even uh, my teammates, you know, like if uh, I got the shirt in the past and I gave them away to people who are close to me. So when I go and see them, I can, yeah. I can still see the shirts and remember. But I was always like the type of guy of like saying, I want my name at the back, not someone else's name. You understand yeah, what yeah. I mean? So yes, I admire people, but I never was a fan. I, I literally stopped myself from being a fan because I thought a footballer can't be a fan. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. you're supposed wow. to play against the people you actually, let's say I was a fan of Rooney. You know, yeah. I admire Rooney, but I wasn't a fan. I didn't want it to be a fan because the day I'm going to play, I don't want to be starstruck. <laughs> you know, yeah. I want to play my game. Yeah. That was me, you know. So that's yeah. why I never literally had some great shirts in my, in, but I just all gave them away. Yeah, wow. In my house, there is no shirt. There is only yeah. one shirt. It's a Reading shirt with my name. That's it. Yeah. I mean, you, you played hundreds of games. Across your career, how many autographs do you reckon you've signed in your life? I missed a thousand, but I don't know. Thousands, <laughs> yeah, easily. Thousands. Do you, do you actually own any memorabilia? Have you got any memorabilia, um, even outside of football? Any film memorabilia or anything like that? No, Forgot just songs. Like, really? Honestly, oh, wow. when I need to see things about me, I sh- just like everyone, I, I put my name on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, like I say, I, my wife's telling me, so you son, what is he going to do? I said, well, internet. <laughs> what can I do? You know what I mean? Obviously, sometimes reading, you know, they post things and there is people who send me, people I've got to know, some fans that I stay in contact with. They send me memories and everything. And when I see them, I smile. But even yeah. I see them, but I never save them. And I need to learn to save things, really, for the yeah. old days. But I don't know. It's, I don't know why. I'm, I'm just like that. I don't know why I'm like that. Yeah. 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 When, you, when, you, when you was growing up and you was obviously um, watching the Premier League, who, who was your hero? Who was your favourite player back then? Uh, obviously, Tony Adams was one of them, obviously, because he was a defender. But um, the one who inspired me when I was closer to the maturity was like the like of Sol Campbell, Fidic, you know, Rio, you know, the Amstan. They're the one I was looking at, you know, I mean, uh, winning the triple and everything and like thinking like, yeah, I need to yeah. be like them. I need to be yeah. there one day. You know, it was one of my dreams to one day play for uh, United because the team I supported when I was young. Didn't happen, but uh, I've got a great memory of him scoring at uh, Old Trafford, so uh, that will make it for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never know. One day, if your management career goes well, you might end up managing them one day, Songs, You never know. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Yeah. You never know, yeah. <laughs> you never Well, Songs, mate, I've really enjoyed you taking the time out and taking Thank us down memory much. today. Thank you so much. Before we let you go, uh, just let us know your closing thoughts and also let people know how they can follow you on social media. Yeah, um, I'm not on Instagram anymore. <laughs> I used to be, but he got act and I never really uh, made another one, you know, uh, thinking about it. But it's one of his things. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Yeah. I'm still on Facebook, you know, but it's, I don't open it as often as I should be. So message it get lost and things like that. Is um, It's one of his, I'm also on X, but once again, you know, I, I used to use it a lot. Now, no much. It's just one of these things, you know, like um, if you contact me and I come across your message, I would always answer whoever you are, you know. Um, if you manage to get a good connection, I will give you my number for us to have a chat. It's no yeah. problem. We all have to all human, you know what I mean? And if you only got good things, you know, to literally say about me, uh, why not listening to you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but often you know I get contacted by fam like can you send us a picture or video for this and this and that and I do it because they're the one who made you who you are really. you know I know like yes we played the game and we enjoyed it and overall yes we have our career but without the fans we nobody you know we are the people watching us cheering us up and everything and spreading our names we are nobody so I try to give them back my time. So um, when they contact me and um, they reach out to me by any means, you know what I mean? I will always 
follow through. If I see your message, I will come back to you because I think I owe you that. You know, you were there to support me when I was a player. So I'm here to give you back some love. Now, well, that's brilliant. What I'll do is I'll make sure that we we find your ex account and your Facebook account, and we'll put that in the. The, the description below so make sure that you go and give Sonks a follow and say hello to him as well and next time he opens up his app he'll hopefully have hundreds of new followers that have all come from uh, <laughs> yeah Sonks mate thanks again for your time mate really enjoyed catching up with you today thank you I really enjoyed it as well thank you so much for that uh,